Yo, LED strips are insanely cool, but using them isn't always straightforward. Today, we're gonna change that. Let's get to it. Before we can get started on an LED project, we need to do a little background. There are two main types of LED strips, analog and digital. Using an analog LED strip is simple. You apply power and the LED comes on. There's a red, green, and blue channel, and by varying the amount of power in each channel, you can get different colors. Easy. The key thing about analog LED strips is that the entire strip can only be one color at a time. It can't do effects or do multiple colors simultaneously. Now, enter digital LED strips. These strips look similar, but in addition to having LEDs, have integrated LED drivers. These drivers allow you to control each LED pixel individually. You can control the LED drivers by using a PWM signal from a microcontroller, typically by using a pre-made library like FastLED or Adafruit's NeoPixel library. These digital LED strips come in a lot of different configurations, from strips to rings to panels. You name it, you can probably find it. Some strips have one LED driver per LED. Other strips, like these, have one LED driver per three LEDs. There are also different LED densities, typically ranging from 30 to 120 LEDs per meter. One important LED strip consideration is the voltage the strip needs. Typically, this is five or 12 volts. So, how do you go about choosing an LED strip? And then, how do you wire it? Well, it's pretty simple. The most common digital LED strips used today have three connectors on them. There's power, signal, and ground. You connect those three things on one end of the strip, you put the power and ground on your power supply, and then you run your signal wire from your microcontroller to your LED strips, and you're off and running. Three connections, that's it. Choosing a strip is really just a matter of preference and finding the LED strip that best matches your project. Lower voltage strips are ideal for small LED setups, and to me, smaller means less than two meters. Longer than that, and voltage drop starts to become a major issue. Here's a little theory for you. As current travels down a wire, it loses voltage due to the resistance of the wire. Voltage drop can be reduced by using thicker wires, because thicker wires have less resistance, using a higher voltage, and three, minimizing the length of your cables. The thin copper wires, which run down the length of the LED strip, have a pretty high resistance. The signal from the microcontroller that goes down the signal wire doesn't typically have issues from voltage drop until you get to distances longer than 10 meters any longer than that, and you'll probably have to add an amplifier to get the signal the rest of the way. The main issue with voltage drop is on the power wire. For example, if I put power on just one end of the 10 meters of LED strips I have, the voltage on the opposite end of the strip is significantly lower. This causes that end of the strip to be noticeably dimmer than the earlier part of the strip, and that's not good. If I run an additional, thicker power wire from my power supply and inject power into my LED strips every two to three meters, I don't have this problem. So the takeaway from all of that is if you want uniform brightness across your strip, you're probably gonna have to run power every two to three meters. For my project, I'm gonna be running 10 meters of LED strips. These strips have 60 LEDs per meter. For every three LEDs, there's one LED driver. According to Adafruit, each three LED pixel draws around 60 milliamps. So 60 milliamps per pixel times 200 pixels total means that the maximum current draw for my 10 meter strip is 12 amps. But that doesn't mean I'll always be drawing 12 amps. If the strip is dimmed or I'm only using certain colors, I'll probably be using way less power. So I bought a readily available 12 volt, 10 amp power supply, which should be enough power. To combat that voltage drop, I'm gonna run some paired 20 gauge wire with my strip. That way I can inject power in multiple locations. Okay. So, how to mount these LEDs. If they're inside or behind something, you could just use some tape or zip ties, and that'll work fine. But because my LEDs are going outside, and this is a permanent setup, I went ahead and picked up some aluminum channels with diffusers. The aluminum channels are great because they come with mounting brackets that let you attach them to just about anything you can screw into, plus the plastic that snaps into the aluminum channels serves as a diffuser, which makes the strips a lot prettier to look at. Okay, so now to the business. How do we control these strips? For my project, I'm gonna be using a Node MCU chip. These chips are awesome. They work just like an Arduino Uno, except they have a built-in ESP8266 chip in it, which allows you to control them over Wi-Fi. What's great about these chips is they're super cheap. 
I got this one for about six bucks. And you can program it with the Arduino IDE. After you write your code, you just plug in a micro USB cable and hit upload. No need for a TFDI adapter or pressing and holding buttons or anything like that. The code I wrote for my LED strips uses the fast LED library and the PubSub library to control the LED strips over Wi-Fi using MQTT. The issue is that this chip takes five volts, but the strips take 12 volts. So you need one of these, which is a 12 volt to five volt step down. You run 12 volt power into one end, five volts come out the other end. Super easy. The other consideration is that the data pins on the Node MCU chip use three volt logic. Ideally for your strips, you'd use five volt logic. That higher voltage will allow the data signal to travel further. If in your setup, you're only using a couple meters of LED strips, you might get away with using the Node MCU chip directly. However, for my setup, because I'm running 10 meters, I need to use a logic shifter. Logic shifters look like this. Using a logic shifter is insanely easy. All you do is you put the low voltage and ground on one side, which in this case is three volts, and the high voltage and ground on the other side, which is five volts. Then you run your data pin in on one side, and then what comes out on the other side is the same signal just shifted to a higher voltage. It's awesome, and they're insanely easy to use. The one I have here is a four channel logic shifter, which means I can shift four separate data signals simultaneously. You really only need one channel here. You can use whatever you have laying around, or if you're buying them to stock up on, I would probably get the four channel variant. I find them the most useful. So for my setup, I soldered everything into a protoboard just to make it look a little nicer, but it's a simple enough circuit that you probably could get away with just using header wires or a breadboard. I put a link to the wiring diagram in the video description below. Feel free to check that out if you have any questions. Uploading the code to the Node MCU board is super simple. First, you'll want to download and install the Arduino IDE. Once you have it downloaded, we'll need to install some prerequisites. First, go to github.com forward slash ESP8266 forward slash Arduino. At the bottom of that repository, there will be a board manager link. Go ahead and copy the link under stable version. Then go to file, preferences. Then where it says additional board manager URL, paste that link and then hit OK. Then go to Tools, Board Manager. In the search, type ESP8266, and it should pop up. I already have this board manager installed, but if I didn't, there should be a button on the right-hand side that says Install. Go ahead and click that. Then go to Sketch, Include Library, Manage Libraries, and search for Fast LED. And again, I have this installed, but it'll say Install on the right-hand side. And you'll also search for pub sub and install that one as well. Then from there, you should be able to copy and paste or open the code I created and it should open up without any issues. Once you have the code in Arduino, there's a couple things you'll need to change. You wanna add your Wi-Fi SSID, your Wi-Fi password, then your MQTT server name and your MQTT username and password. If you don't have an MQTT server set up yet, Check out my earlier video where I talk about how to set that up with Home Assistant. Then after that, you can leave data pin alone. Under LED type, you can change this if you're using a different type of LED strip. In my case, I'm using WS2811 LED drivers. The color order for my strips is BRG. Then you'll want to change the number of LEDs you're using in your configuration. Keep in mind, this is the number of LED drivers you have. From there, you should be ready to upload your code. To do that, go to Tools, Board, and then towards the bottom, select Node MCU 1.0. After that, you're ready to upload your code. The settings I use are a CPU frequency of 80, flash size 4M, an upload speed of 115,200. You'll know it's working when you go to Tools and Port, and you see a new COM value pop up here. Go ahead and select whatever pops up, in my case, minus COM6, and from here, you're ready to go. Go ahead and hit the Upload arrow. You'll know it's working okay if the blue light on your Node MCU is blinking. Okay, now it's done. To verify that you're connected to the Wi-Fi, you can go to Tools and then Serial Monitor. It might say a little bit of gibberish, but then it should say connecting to your Wi-Fi network, your IP address for your Node MCU chip, and then tempting MQTT connection, and then connected. If you see all of those things, that's really good. 
So after you get your Node MCU flashed, the next thing we'll need to do is to add some things to our Home Assistant configuration. The first thing you'll need to do is to set up MQTT. If you don't know how to do this, check out my previous video. It's pretty easy. After that, we're going to enable the MQTT Lite component. The cool thing about how this component works is that there's a command and state topic. The command topic is the MQTT topic that Home Assistant publishes to to control the Node MCU chip. The state topic is what Home Assistant subscribes to, so that when the Node MCU acts on the message it receives, it sends a message back and says, hey, I'm actually blue, or hey, I'm actually on. It's pretty cool. Besides the MQTT light component, the next thing you'll want to set up is the input select and input slider components. The input select component I set up allows me to select the effect for the LED strip. The input slider allows me to set the animation speed. These two components rely on two automations in order for them to fire an MQTT message. This first automation sends an MQTT message that contains the effect name that you select with the input select component. It's a mouthful. The second one sends the animation speed in much the same way. If you don't want to create all this from scratch, you can just copy and paste what I have here, assuming you haven't changed any of the names. Once you add all this information to your Home Assistant configuration, go ahead and hit save, and then restart Home Assistant. If everything works, you should see three things pop up in your user interface. A switch to control the lights, an effect selector, and then an animation speed. By the way, these are grouped together using the groups component. Yeah, again, you can check out my earlier video if you want to know how to set that up. Okay, so let's get to the wiring. My first go at this failed miserably. I spent like forever trying to solder these strips together or run power lines with five-stranded wire because I was trying to be fancy and it just did not work. But I learned a couple important lessons. If you can avoid soldering two ends of the LED strips together, then do it. The copper pads themselves are not hard to solder to, but they have no structural strength. So if you pull in one of the strips, It'll pull the pad right off and then you're hosed and it's a pain and I hate it and it ruined my life and I lost so much of it and I just don't solder these together like this. Unless they're fixed and it's easy and it's not going to have any structural pull on it at all. And then do it. But for the people who need some structural strength to connect their strips, there's a solution. This guy. I bought 10 of these adapters on Amazon for a couple bucks, and I would highly, highly recommend them. They have a latched opening, and you can just slide the strip in, clamp it down, and the connection is made. It's that easy. You can connect the other end to another strip, or you can cut it, and then you have some real wire to solder to. Okay, now that all of that is out of the way, let's install these stupid strips.
How exciting is this project? I don't know, I just love LED strips. If you guys have not played with LEDs yet, you definitely should, and I hope that this video helps inspire you guys to get working with them. There's no reason why you shouldn't have LED lights that are smart, automatable, controllable from anywhere in the world, and like, not super expensive. I mean, five meters of those LEDs are like 30 bucks, plus whatever else you want to do for your setup. I mean, you could easily be $50 in on this and have very, very cool lights. By the way, this code that I shared also works really well with Adafruit NeoPixel rings and other types of LEDs. So don't limit your creativity to just linear strips. Granted, it might take a little tweaking to make the effects look right, but... Anyway, I put links to everything below if you're interested in what I bought and my code and all the other documentation. It's all in the video description. As always, let me know if you have any questions or if there's things I can do to help. And stay tuned, I got some really cool things coming for Christmas coming up, including a giveaway and some other things. So if you like the video and want to see more, subscribe and hit that like button. And yeah, I'll see you guys in the next one. Happy automating. Cheers.